this is something that utterly transforms the market in sex in the ancient world. There are undoubted sex slaves working in this country. They are women and sometimes young men who've been brought into the country under false pretenses and who have been put into some kind of fraudulent debt and they're working these debts off by selling their bodies and handing the money over to various pimps. But this is an illegal, a marginal activity. In the ancient world, sex slaves were endemic and they tended to suppress the top end of the market in sexual services. If you were a wealthy Roman, you might have 400 slaves in your house. You might have so many slaves that you need a special slave called a nomenclator who would accompany you through the house, reminding you of the names of the slaves in your house. Indeed, if you look wider than household slavery, Athenaeus in the 3rd century AD claims that some wealthy individuals owned as many as 10,000 or 20,000 slaves. Most of these were working in the fields, but a wealthy Roman household could easily have several hundred slaves, which meant that if you were a wealthy Roman, or if you lived in a household of wealthy Romans, you would not need, you might as a matter of preference, but you did not need to look outside the household for sexual services. According to Gaius, a Roman lawyer in the second century, slavery is the state that is recognized by the law of nations in which someone is subject to the dominion of another person contrary to nature. If you were a slave owner, you had the undisputed right to demand such services of your slaves as took your fancy and do not imagine that sexual services were excluded from this general right. So this tended, only tended, but it tended to limit the market for prostitution to the lower classes. Here we have some representations of slaves as sex objects. And let's have a look at this image in the middle of the slide. This is a slave collar found in North Africa in 1906, and it was found together with the bones of a girl in her early teens. It says, Adultera meritrix, tene, quia fugivi di bulla regia. I am a disgusting whore. Detain me, for I have escaped from the town of Bulla Regia. It was very common for slave owners to tag their slaves, much as we do with household pets. You would fuse a collar around the neck of your slave, sometimes with words on the collar or sometimes with a lead medallion dangling from this collar, which would give the name and the reasonable address of your owner and would advertise a reward for your apprehension and your return to your master. So there is undoubted evidence of a sex slave, somebody who was compelled to work in a brothel, whose escape was anticipated and whose successful escape was prevented by that collar, which only came off after she was dead. And here you have in the bottom left something from Seneca the Younger, 1st century AD. Naked she stood on the shore at the pleasure of the purchaser. Every part of her body was examined and felt. Would you hear the result of the sale? The pirate sold, the pimp bought, that he might employ her as a prostitute. And here is a 19th century French representation on the right of the sale of a sex slave. You can see this young woman is facing an army of rather elderly and ugly hard-faced men who are all bidding for the right to rape her. I suppose the only moderate hope is that the young man in the bottom right of the slide who is asking his father, go on daddy, bid for her. I'll be ever so good if you buy her. 
perhaps should be bought by him and it may not turn out to be quite so bad but really you can't say and this was a standard fact of the ancient world slaves were openly bought and sold for sexual services the nature of the sexual services here again is seneca in the first century a.d there was a man called hostius quadra whose obscene acts even became the subject of a theatrical performance he was rich greedy a slave to his millions the deified augustus did not consider him worth being avenged when he was murdered by his slaves and almost proclaimed that he seemed to have been murdered justly as an aside if one slave at a household murdered his master a strict reading of roman law required that all the slaves in the household should be put to death because they were presumed to have been in a position where they could have prevented the murder of their master but didn't as such they were counted as accomplices so hostius quadra must have been deeply offensive to the moral considerations of augustus for him not to take advantage of that law he was vile in relation not to one sex alone but lusted after men as well as women he had mirrors made of the type i have described the ones that reflect images far larger in which a finger exceeded the size and thickness of an arm these moreover he so arranged that when he was offering himself to a man he might see in a mirror all the movements of his stallion behind him and then take delight in the false size of his partner's very member just as though it were really so big again a slave is a living machine a piece of property a slave does whatever it is instructed and if a master wanted these services it was the legal requirement of the slave to comply and if the slave refused to comply the slave could be punished no questions asked there is a slightly jollier account of this in the bottom right petronius first century a.d and i shall be relying on petronius quite a lot i was my master's lover during 14 years and what of it nothing wrong in what a master commands indeed i also saw to his wife but whether you take a gloomy or a jolly view of the matter sex slavery was an endemic fact in the ancient world and as i said it tended to depress the upper end of the market in free sexual services 